All right. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and thank you for the invitation for this. And this is just fun stuff, just good stuff. Um, yeah, University of Nebraska, and for those that didn't in the room that don't know that, but um, Dr. Gold was my department head when I started my master's degree up there. And then, of course, Dr. Gold came down to be the first endowed you know, chair for the urban entomology program at Texas A&M. And he's the one that got me in contact with Bobby Jenkins back in the day, and that brought me to Texas. So that's kind of a, a little bit of that back history, a little bit. But uh, I, I look at the participants, a lot of, a lot of good friends there. I, I recognize most of the names on there. So this is a fantastic morning. And, and what I'd like to do is, is just talk about, you know, I heard Jesse say something about he was in New York and didn't see many bugs, right? But he did see rats. But we're going to talk about bugs today. <laughs> so that's kind of what I want to focus on. So Andy, what I'm going to do, I'm going to see if I can share my screen, and I'm going to let you tell me what if, if it's coming up. How's that look? And I'm going to put it in presentation mode right now. Yeah, there you go. That looks good. Yep. Everything's okay? All right. Everything's great. All right. I'd say, you know, if anybody has any questions, you know, throw it in the chat real quick, or, you know, we're pretty informal here. Um, I got, you know, material, but when we get to the top of the hour, we'll just, you know, end it at that time and go from there. But I do want to talk about, you know, insects, right? Because uh, uh, the basis of a lot of our services that we do are, of course, are based upon pests. Now, they're not all insects. We have uh, like that, but rats and mice, and they're certainly not insects. And we have other arthropods like scorpions and spiders that drive a lot of services too. But certainly insects as a whole are our base for a lot of what we do. Uh, here's my contact stuff. Um, during this presentation, it's being recorded. So you can always go back to Jesse and, and watch it again. But if you'd like to take a picture or print screen or something or whatever, please do. And, and there's my contact stuff if you'd like to do that. Uh, certainly uh, it's available. Um, so this presentation that I kind of worked on and put together over the last number of years, right? It's just, it's just about the bugs. It's about the insects. It's about their life processes. But I relate that to what we do in the field, you know, with our inspections, our control strategies, because some of those life strategies they do is, is key for how we do our services, right? And that's part of what we're doing. And as uh, Andy said, you know, I, I do work for BSF. I just want to mention, we got a lot of stuff going on in our pipeline. Uh, we're looking forward to launching this uh, RFID uh, lid locator later on this year for our bait stations. But we got some new actives and also some new formulations coming out we're very excited about. So just keep your eyes open. Ronnie Holder and I will we'll share the information as it comes out. But we're pretty excited about that. I think everybody in the virtual room here, I think we all realize insects are critical, right? I mean, they're beneficial organisms across the board because of the things they do. They're part of our ecosystem. Certainly pollination of crops is huge. Without pollinators, of course, the food supply we have would be extremely stressed. We wouldn't be able to feed the world. That's just what it boils down to. So crop pollination is huge. Uh, insects do produce, right? You talk about honey, you talk about silk, talk about uh, different dyes and lacs and lacquers. You know, the, the, many, some of those, much of that comes from insects, right? And then of course, being part of the ecosystem, Many insects are, you know, part of the food supply for other animals and other insects, but also they're also part of the biocontrol part of what we do because many of them are, are, are predators, right? And they're feeding upon other insects or spiders, or whatever it might be, and they can also be part of parasitism and such too. And, and there's a lot of, a massive amount of recycling going on, right? And of course, termites come to mind, right? Because they're recycling wood back into the soil for regrowth, but you know, every time I got the animals out here on the property that are dropping their stuff off the, the south end of the north, you know, north mountain cow, right? The dung beetles come in, right? And they're working on the dung and they're, and they're recycling that back into the soil. So, and this happens on a, a worldwide basis and it really keeps the, the plant growth going and the carbon cycle going and everything else too. But there's a lot of threats from these insects. We all know the most dangerous animal in the world is not, you know, Putin over there in Russia, although he's pretty dangerous, right? But but it's the mosquito because of the virus, because of the, the various viruses and such that they carry, right, or can transmit. And of course, insects, the damage to the crops that we have, the damage to food supplies that are in storage. You know, one of the major, major challenges mankind is going to have from now on is, in, is feeding the world. And if we can limit the amount of damage into stored grains and from the crop and everything else, all the way to the kitchen table, if we can limit the damage from pests, then we can help feed, you know, feed people across this world. And of course, we deal a lot with damage to structures, whether it's termites or carpenter ants, whatever it might be. 
And, and then, of course, a lot of your services are driven because people are bothered by insects or bothered by spiders or bothered by scorpions, right? Uh, and, and some of those can just be nuisance type of things, too. So this is the kind of stuff I'm going to talk about here over the next, you know, 45 minutes or so, uh, just about the insects and, and why they're so successful and what that means from an evolutionary standpoint. And we'll go through some of these processes and, and what it means for the insects and their success, but also what it means for us for inspections and control and what we can do. So let's talk about, you know, evolution. So insects have been around for, you know, 250 to 280 million years, right? Ever, ever since back in the Carboniferous stage. If you think about that, now these we've had many species go extinct, but we've had many species evolve and continue to evolve to help them be successful as they go forward. One of the key aspects of insects that allows them to be successful is the use of an exoskeleton, right? So we, as people, we have an endoskeleton. We have bones inside and our muscles and everything else attached to that and provide structure and form. But for insects, the, exo, the, the skeleton is on the outside, like this plate of armor kind of thing. And it does a lot of stuff. It, it's lightweight because of the way the proteins are made. But yes, yeah, continuous coverage all the way around. But yet, gas exchange can happen through it. Air exchange can happen through it. Um, and, and it, But yet, it protects from desiccation, protects from predation, pathogens, uh, and lots of different toxic substances. So a lot of things going on. But also, it's something the muscles attach to, right? Because the muscles have to be able to uh, contract and expand and do their work, and they have to have something to latch onto, and that would be the exoskeleton. So it's a very unique type of uh, evolutionary aspect. We also know that insects, for the most part, are pretty darn small, right? But there are some insects that are almost a foot long, if you think about that, uh, down in the tropics and such, right? But most are pretty small, and that means allows them to get into lots of different types of habitats, right? And that means they can get to different types of food sources and they can hide from predation and they can, you know, don't need a lot of food because they're smaller type insects, right? And they, and they can do all these different habitats. So that helps with the success of a lot of these different species. And depending on the insects, some of them are extremely mobile, right? I mean, quite a few of them fly, not all of them, right? But what does fly, flight do? Well, it allows them to run from predators, you know, avoid predators, they can find new habitats, new ecosystems. They can find food sources. They can find the proper places to lay the eggs for the next generation to, to go forth. And of course, you know, the migration right now, you know, monarch butterflies have been coming through to starting their migration to Canada. Then they'll come back, you know, next year to go in the winter to go back into uh, to Mexico. Um, some of them burrow, right? And that gives them a whole different set of habitats. Now think about a mole cricket, how protected they are and the food sources they find. And many insects are extremely good at running or walking. Think about the, the roaches that we're dealing with out there in our accounts, right? And, and how, how uh, apt they are at running once they detect something that is in the area. And, and maybe you've heard this term, uh, most insects are what we call R strategists. And what that means is they kick out a lot of babies, right? An elephant and people, we're K strategists. We don't kick out a lot of babies, right? And usually the biggest difference is for a K strategist, like people with elephants and tigers, whatever, the, the parents put a lot of care into the young, which increases the survivability of that young. But for most insects, they don't care about the young too much. I mean, there's, there's some exceptions, right? But for the most part, they just kick out a lot of numbers, and then it's a numbers game, how many of them are going to make it uh, you know, to adults where they can actually uh, provide more offspring. And many of these R strategists have short generation times, right? You think about when the season starts, how many generations of house flies can you have from the spring up into the fall, right? I mean, we're talking, you know, 15, 20, 30, whatever it is, you may have seven or eight different generations of fire ants, right? So you can see lots of different generations. Some species have parthenogenesis. What that means is the female can reproduce without having insemination by the male, right? And aphids do this quite a bit and a few other species of insects. Um, some species like the earwig, they actually give birth to live young. Now, there is an egg, right? But the egg stays in internal and then it hatches and that first instar emerges, but they care for that first instar for a bit. So here's one where they actually care for the young a little bit, which increases the survivability of the species. So the other part that we're all quite aware of is this evolutionary aspect of metamorphosis, right? So, and I love this picture because here we're showing a butterfly, but think about it. There's an egg, 
and then you have these end stars, and then you have a pupil stage, and then you have an adult stage that can fly, right? We're talking about total changes over the over this metamorphosis. Not only changes in the individual, but changes in the habitat of where those individual life stages are found. Where that flying butterfly is, that swallowtail, is not the same place as where you're going to find the caterpillar, right? Caterpillar is going to be feeding on the plants, feeding on the leaves, right? And, and some insects can overwinter as adults, some as pupae, some as eggs, you know, and, and just depending on the different types of uh, insect we're talking about. Okay, I, you know, we know that's an insect, right? In fact, we even know it's a grasshopper. You know, a second grader is going to be able to tell us that's an insect and that's a grasshopper. But, but I'm just going to ask the room, and you can, you know, if you want to put in chat or kick in, you can. What characteristics tell us that's an insect? How do we know that's an insect? What do you think, Andy? Put you on the spot. Put you on the spot. Okay, head to unmute there. I'm going to start with six legs. Fantastic. Yeah, and that's the kind of characteristics we're looking at, right? That's a great start. We're going to look at, like you said, the, the legs, three pairs of legs, six legs total. And we're also going to look at, we have three major body regions, right? There's an antenna, a pair of antennae. And we already talked about the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is a critical part of arthropods, right? Which insects are arthropods. So we've got the head region. And then on the head, we can have that those antennal structures. And many insects will have eyes, not all do. And some have compound eyes. And some have what we call simple eyes, right? That's a little different. And, and this grasshopper, of course, it has the mouth parts, the labium and the and labrum. So you got the head region, then you got the thoracic region, and there's three subregions to that. And then that's where the eggs, uh, the legs attach, right? But also, if there are wings, which there are in the grasshopper here, they will also be attached to the thoracic region. And there's those three pairs of jointed legs. Remember, arthropod, I use that term, right? Arthropod means jointed leg, right? And insects are certainly arthropods. And then insects, depending on the species and, you know, the, the, the adult stage and such, they can either have no wings or one pair of wings or two pairs of wings, right? Depending on, on the species. And then there's the abdominal region, which is our third region, which, you know, that's the bulbous area that's got, you know, a lot of the respiratory and and reproductive and excretion and all those type of aspects going on. So those are the things that characterize insects, right? And, and go back to this exoskeleton, really, because it really is critical, right? And, and what the exoskeleton is, it, it's a it's composite of basically three or four different layers, right? Start with that waxy layer on top, a conticular layer in between that's kind of broken up in different layers in these epidermal cells. But what's critical is it's composed of, of proteins. And one of the most critical proteins is chitin, right? It's a very special protein. It's very strong. It's also flexible, right? And allows for the flexing of the exoskeleton. And this is another huge part about insects, right? They have a large surface area versus its volume. Even for a small insect, it's still, when compared to the volume, it has a large surface area. So what's very tough about that for insects is you have to keep the water in and if you have a large surface area to your volume, that means the water has a tendency to leave and you can desiccate quite easily. So that's why this waxy layer is so important. The waxy layer is right on top here of the exoskeleton. It helps keeps the water in so they don't desiccate. Okay, think about insects living, especially West Texas and places like that where it's very dry, right? They have to keep them from drying out. So here's that picture again of this exoskeleton. You can see there's a lot of sensory type organs and structures that are in, in, in involved with the exoskeleton because you have to sense the environment. It isn't just the antennae that's in sensing the environment, right? There's lots of uh, pits and hairs and trichomes and stuff that can be utilized to sense the environment around them. We also know that insects molt. And when they molt, they have to lose their exoskeleton. And many of us have seen, you know, uh, cicadas and, and sites like that that leave their exoskeleton behind with their molt or whatever, right? And when they molt, uh, then they have to form a new one. And of course, we can target that as part of our control. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. So here's an example, right? So I just talked about keeping the water in so they don't desiccate. Well, here's a product called Tri-Dye. And within Tri-Dye, it has multiple active ingredients, right? So it's, it's a combination chemistry. 
But one of the, the active ingredients is the silica aerogel. And what aerogel does, right, is it absorbs that wax that's on that waxy layer of the insect. And when that wax is now gone from that area, what can happen? Well, the water can come out and it's more and, and the insect can desiccate and die, right? So that that's one of the ways tri dye provides its control. It also has um, synergized pyrethrins to get a little faster knockdown too. But the, the residual control, if you will, is that silica aerogel, get it on the insect, and as they pick it up, it messes up their waxy layer. And similar to that is diatomaceous earth. It works a little differently. It doesn't absorb the waxy layer, but what it does is it cuts it up, it abrades it, right? And when that waxy layer is messed up, again, the water can come out. And you know, like the alpine dust, it's got the diatomaceous earth as the base, but it has the dinotechnin in on there also to give you that dual active ingredient approach. So look at the head, you know, we'll go back to the grasshopper here, but there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? The antenna, huge for sense in the environment, right? But in this case, so is the compound eye. And then it's also got the, the upper lip and the lower lip, we call it the labrum and the, and, uh, and the labium. Uh, and those mandibles are used certainly for chewing and food support and all that kind of thing, but it can also be used for helping with uh, grasping and, and some of the uh, 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 reproduction too. So there's a lot of difference between insects and their mouth parts, and it goes back to their food supply and are they predaceous or not predaceous, right? And we'll start here with chewing mouth parts. So when we look at various pests, or insects, we'll just say, you can look at the mouth bars to see, you know, what type of habitat are they? Are they predators? Are they something they feed upon plants, whatever it might be? And here you can see like termites, of course, they have the chewing mouth parts, so they chew upon the wood. Praying mantis has a chewing mouth part, of course. Uh, roaches, ants, caterpillars. Caterpillars will have different mouth parts than the adult, right? Because the adult will have it, will not have chewing mouth parts for the butterfly or the moth. So differences in the mouth parts. Another type we might see, or like for the mosquitoes or the aphids, right, have these piercing, pierce, and then they suck up the blood. They suck up the plant juices, right? Piercing, sucking uh, type mouth parts. Now, here's that adult butterfly, or it could be adult moth to a different picture, right? But uh, look at how we have a siphoning tube that actually drops down into the crawl of the plant to pick up the nectar, right? That's totally different than those chewy mouth parts that we saw with the larval forms. And then for flies, many of them, uh, like watch a house fly land on your mashed potatoes, right? They're taking these little spongy pads and getting down there and putting the saliva on there and, and starting to digest it and pick up the gooey stuff as fast as they can, right? Of course, that's a health thing, too, so they can transmit uh, viruses and bacteria as they do that. Uh, thrips and mites, and uh, they do have um, uh, rasping mouth parts. In fact, some Biting thrips are actually, that can, that can hurt quite readily, right? Another raspy would be like a horse fly, right? That hits you real hard. Uh, are mites insects? The answer is no, they're not, um, but they are, you know, a related arthropod. Uh, honeybees have chewing mouth parts, but also lapping. So as they chew, they lap up uh, the, the nectar and stuff that they're feeding upon and the sugars. Um, then we can look at the antennae, right? Now, the antennae are really critical. There's a ton of variation out there about different types of antennae. Grasshoppers we're looking at, they have what we call thread-like. Uh, termites and rove beetles have these beaded antennae. I just love that picture, that rove beetle top. You can see the, the straight single beads, right? And of course, we know termites have that also. Uh, beetles have some of the most ornate types of antennae you might see. And you can see the mouth parts here on, on this uh, stag beetle are quite ornate, but look at the antennae too. And you can see how it's a clubbed antennae, but it's actually got a different type of club on the end, which is pretty fascinating. Um, leaf beetles, uh, they have toothed antennae or what we call serrate because it looks like a, a saw, you know, saw blades, right? Uh, so we'll see that on many leaf beetles. Uh, and many of you have seen these uh, feathery, uh, feathered or uh, uh, feathered antennae that we have with these moths, right? They're quite beautiful, right? But think of all the surface area here that can be utilized for sensory, but also it helps with, uh, you know, camouflage and, and mimicry too. Um, hoverflies, and up here at the top, that's an aristate type of, or aristate uh, type of antennae. It's got a bulbous part and then a fil filamentous type uh, structure coming off it. Look at the size of that uh, compound eye there, too. So quite fascinating. Uh, elbowed antennae, we see that with wasps and ants, which is one way we can tell the difference between termites, because termites have the bead-like, while the ants and wasps will have the elbowed antennae. Um, 
And then we can look at the thoracic region, okay? So I mentioned that the, there's you have a head, a thorax, and abdomen, but even within the thorax, we have a prothorax, which is the front, a mesothorax, which is the middle, and a metathorax, which is the back, okay? And this is, this is important because uh, when we look at the insect for identification, you know, the, the, each pair of legs is going to be attached to each one of these segments, right? So the front pair of legs will be to the prothorax and so forth and so on. But also, if there's wings, then if there's two pair, they will always be on the meso and the meta. They will never be attached to the prothorax. But if there's one pair of wings, it'll be on the mesothorax. So pretty fascinating there, too. Then we can look at the leg types. Again, tons of changes based on the species and the habitats they're in and and how they you know run from cover or how they predate on something else or how they do their reproduction right you know ants have have walking legs right and, and we see them trailing all the time they're extremely good at the walking and the running that they do mantids of course we saw this picture earlier but fantastic grasping because they they got you know the long legs with the with the, all the spines on they can grab that prey and hold as they feed upon it uh, th that third set of legs on the grasshopper uh, coming off of that metathorax, right? It's extremely large to put a lot of torque in there and a lot of stored energy for allowing them to jump. Um, you can kind of see this picture of the upper right, this Japanese diving beetle, but look at the enhanced or enlarged area that gives it an opportunity to push water like a paddle, right? So very good at swimming in the uh, um, fresh water. Uh, mole crickets, you've all seen mole crickets, I'm sure, but quite large uh, and large femurs on those front legs they use for digging. So very specialized there. Now, I love this picture. This is a you know, urticating caterpillar. And it's, it'd be somewhat similar to the asps that we see here in Texas, right? But these urticating hairs are sensory hairs, but they're also protective. And, you know, if, if a predator tries to feed upon this, those urticating hairs can be stinging and give them lots of issues. Uh, cockroaches, very good at running, right? We've seen that. Um, they have other sensory organs besides the antenna. They have those circe in the back, which are kind of like another set of antennae on the rear end, which makes them, you know, very easy at protecting themselves. And then, you know, we can look at those that do fly, those that have wings, okay? Not all insects fly, not all insects have wings, uh, but certainly moths and butterflies, <clears throat> they have what we call scaled wings, right? And then the uh, the box elder bugs that we're showing here, this is a hemiptera, but notice a kind of, we, it's it's kind of like a hemi lytra. Hemi means half, and that's kind of like it's because a half winged, where this wing sticks out behind uh, this one here, that's kind of a half size. That's where that comes from, that name. Flies have membranous uh, wings, and we'll talk about these halteres here. What a fantastic structures that they are. Uh, beetles have a, what we call a elytra on this top. So this front wing is kind of a wing cover to the member's wing behind, and it protects it uh, quite readily underneath there. Then we can look at the abdomen, right? So the abdomen is an is a extremely important part of the insect because it's providing all the life services it need for reproduction, digestion, excretion, respiratory, blood work, all that kind of stuff too. And a lot of the, the reproductive genital type things will be associated with the abdomens too, whether it's an ovipositor, uh, like many insects like a, a female cricket we use to put their eggs in the sand or claspers that males would use for uh, during mating, right? But, you know, think about aphids. Aphids have those, you know, cornicles, those, those rear end tailpipes, right? And those are used to kick out alarm pheromones. Uh, I just mentioned the Circe and the cockroaches is kind of like another set of antenna on the back end that they can detect air movement, vibrations, different things, allow them to escape. And then we've all seen, you know, larvae from Lepidoptera that have what, these little pro legs. And it's like, well, what are those for? Well, the larvae have to hang on to the stems as they feed upon the plants, right? So it helps them with that too. And within the abdomen, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I've already mentioned a lot of this digestion, circulatory, nervous. Hormones, pheromones, lots of things happening. And, and I love this picture of the insect. I mean, it's, it's pretty basic, but still, it shows a lot of stuff going on. We have this dorsal, right? Dorsal type blood uh, setup, and we'll talk about that. And then in the center, we have a digestive tract, okay? And then we have a ventral, right? And, and, and a nervous system with all these different ganglia. And that's kind of backwards from us, right? From, from mammals, right? Where we're going to have a dorsal uh, uh, ganglia and such. We're going to have a uh, the, the, uh, blood will be a little bit different too. So a little bit different. 
So what's critical about the digestive system, I just want to mention this, we have some products like borates that work extremely well within the digestive system. So once they're groomed or internalized, or they're fed upon like a bait, like this tarot bait here, or this entice bait, they get inside the, the, uh, the, the digestive system, and they break up that lining, and they make it where they can't actually bring the food in and use it as a food source. And that's what allows the, the borate to kill the insect, right? It impacts that stomach lining. Uh, another one is Amdro, right? So Amdro Pro, and this is our product we actually make. It's not the same Amdro as you have at the at the grocery stores or whatever, but our distribution partners sell Amdro Pro. It has a fantastic label. It's great for pastures and everything else too. So it's a, it's a really broad label. Um, but the way it works, right? It works in that cell system and it stops the individual cell from converting food into energy, okay? So it's, it's not a nerve agent. It works a little bit differently. And that's why... One reason we don't see uh, uh, resistance to it because it works with the mitochondria. So let's look at the respiratory system. I just, and, the, uh, and this is very comp you know, complex, you can see by the, the structures, right? But what I wanna point out is we as people, right? And mammals, right? We have a lung that we bring air in and we, it, we take out CO2 by breathing it out. And then the, the oxygen and CO2 are transported by the blood system. That's not what happens with insects. In fact, they don't have a lung. What they have is a whole bunch of tubes that we call trachea and tracheoles that bring the oxygen to the muscles and, and to the, the organs, but then pick up the CO2 and kick it out through the spiracles. So they use a whole bunch of tubes for the respiratory stuff while we use an open lung. Okay. So it's totally different. So, and, and they don't use blood at all to util, to transport the oxygen or the CO2. So it's different, right? But yet we can we can target this respiratory system through some of our aspects. You know, fumigation comes to mind, right? There's other things that we have too that that can get in through that spiracle. And of course, the spiracle is really critical for the insects because they can open and close the spiracle based on gas exchange. But also, if it gets really really dry and they're getting stressed for water, they can start to close them down even more. So they can, you know, they're still going to get some gas exchange, but yet they're going to keep the water in even more, right? Help them to not desiccate. But we're, we can, you know, we can target the respiratory system. One, one great example is uh, fumigation. And then they have what we call a whole set of pulsatile organs. I'm going to use the term hearts here, right? But really they're just a internet connection is unstable. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, anyway, the, these pulsatile organs, they pump the, the hemolymph is the term we use. That's their blood around and it sloshes around the insect, but it sloshes around inside the insect with some uh, direction, right? So it goes up into the legs and up into the antenna because this blood is what takes the food to all the muscles, but then grabs the waste and takes the waste back so we can then put out through the excretory system. So again, it's a little bit different. Here we're using uh, just an open sloshing kind of thing with some pressure behind it. We also use, I say we, the insects utilize the circulatory system, the hemolymph to move around hormones. And probably the best example is the juvenile hormone, which the more juvenile hormones in the insect, that means it's a, it's a, a younger immature, right? A smaller caterpillar, right? And then as it gets older and goes through the molts, there's less and less juvenile hormone present. Oh, Dr. Bob's froze up here for a second, guys. Let's uh, give him a second to see if connection will clean up. All right, Let's see what's happening here. There we go, Bob, you're back. Okay, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do also. I'm gonna go ahead and shut down my video because sometimes that might, uh, is that okay? Can you hear me still? Yes, sir. We okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I shut down the video. Sometimes it helps with the bandwidth. Anyway, we had some storms come through last night. It might have impacted our provider. Who knows? Anyway, the uh, uh, we can target uh, controlling these pests by using what we call juvenile hormone analogs. So they're, they're chemistries that look like juvenile hormone and they impact them during reproduction, okay? Here's a fantastic picture taken from Kathy Heinstein at Purdue University showing that when this insect molted, 
and the juvenile hormone analog, in this case, it'd be like Gentrol, right, was in the system, it caused these wings to be all crinkled up and messed up. So not only is the wings all crinkled up and messed up, but they're not going to reproduce, they're not going to do the things they can, and it's going to help in production, uh, in uh, control of that population over time, right? So we can use this methoprene, or we can use pyroproximin, these growth regulators, because they're juvenile hormone analogs. Now, they're really going to impact the immatures, right? Because once you're an adult, you know, you're not going to molt anymore for the most part, right? So uh, it's going to impact those, those populations as those younger ones go through the bolts. And then, of course, we have the nervous system. And it's a little different than ours, right? You know, we have a central brain and then we have nerves and ganglia that go throughout the body. And there is a, what we call a brain in the insect, but really it's just an enlarged ganglia. And then you have another you know, three fairly large ganglia within the thorax, and then you get smaller ones in the abdomen. And then they have the nerves that innervate down to the muscles and the neuro, you know, neuromuscular junctions to help the muscles do what they're supposed to do. So it's not really a central brain, right? It's just a, 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 a areas where they have more ganglia, okay? But we have a lot of products that target the nervous system of the insects. Um, and, and, we, and we recognize these families like pyrethroids and organophosphates and carbamates, right? Uh, phenylpyrazole, that's the terminal product, right? Uh, neonicotinoids, that's the alpine WSG or the, the premise, right? They will impact parts of the nervous system. We also have quite a few that don't. We just talked about juvenile hormone analogs, right? Uh, pyroles, that'd be phantom. That works in the mitochondria, not in the nervous system. So we have different ones too. But, but here's some great examples, you know, the alpine WSG, the neonicotinoid, the termidor, a phenylpyrazole. I put seven in here. That's really about our only carbamate left that's, a, that's available uh, that we're aware of that can be used in the United States. And, of course, the pyrethroids. And there's a lot of pyrethroids out there, right? Uh, Arfendona, uh, Psykick, you know, those are examples that we can talk about, Tau Star, Demand, those would be examples too. And there's different active ingredients that we would have within those different product lines. But what I want to mention is not that we have just all these different products, but those products, depending on class of family, impact different parts of the nervous system. So the pyrethroids are going to impact this nervous sheath and cause sodium ions to leak, okay? But if you go to like the, the termidor, right? Termidor is going to impact this uh, neurotransmitter junction on this side of the, what we call a synaptic cleft. And, and what I mean by a synaptic cleft is here you have this nervous system going down, and then you have a, 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 an opening, which we call a cleft. And now the neurotransmitter has to jump from this side to this side to either keep the signal going down the nerve, or if this is a muscle, to make the muscle do the contraction or whatever it's supposed to do. Well, if we have alpine, alpine is going to bind right here, and it's going to stop this neurotransmitter from doing what it's supposed to do. While terminor is going to bind here and mess up that neurotransmitter. Well, the organophosphates, they actually impact directly on the neurotransmitter, not the receptor. Why am I saying all this? Just to mention that that's why we rotate different classes of chemistry, because there's different target sites within the nervous system, and this will help us not allow insects to have the resistance to those individual technologies, right? So it's important to rotate because of these different target sites. Okay, a lot there. There's a ton of differences in reproductive systems. And just read this about driver ants. Oh my gosh, right? Driver ants can lay one to four million eggs every 25 days. The queens can have 15,000 ovarials. My gosh, right? But then you have an earwig that might kick out three or four, <laughs> right? So, and some of these eggs, they can overwinter, you know, depending on the species and where they're at in the world, but other ones, they can hatch quite quickly. If you got a bird bath outside and you've had it out there a few, for a few days, you better go look. You've got eggs and you've probably got some tumblers and wrigglers already going, right? So you have to be careful with that. We also, I mentioned parthenogenesis, right? So aphids and, and such, you know, they don't necessarily need the males around. Uh, with their sperm because they can create, uh, uh, you know, more females uh, during their uh, their reproduction with parthenogenesis. And then usually one time during the year or twice, they'll have a, a sexual reproduction to allow males to happen. So that way they can keep their fitness going and they can, next year, they'll just do all parthenogenesis again. Then we have other insects that give birth to live young, you know, some aphids, uh, uh, some uh, uh, like CC flies and stuff will do that kind of thing too. 
And then of course, chemistries, right? We've talked about juvenile hormones. So there's chemistries like hormones that are produced within the insect to be used for their processes, like metamorphosis. But then we have pheromones. And pheromones are chemistries that the insect sends outward to interact with other insects. Could be the same species or maybe even different species, right? Um, and, and that will then, you know, maybe a, a signal's put out by a female that says, hey, it's time to mate. And the male detects that and finds that female, right? That, and of course, we use pheromone technology with our mating disruption and some of our Indian meal moth lures and things like that to help us with monitoring and also with control. Then there's protective mechanisms. What a great picture here, right? With this Katie just showing how protected it is. And I love this picture. This is These are uh, cedar moths. And through evolutionary time, they have developed strategies where they have the pigmentation and the orientation of their behavior to sit on the side of the cedar tree and blend in with um, with the striping of the cedar, right? What event, I mean, just think about that and how that's developed over evolutionary time. And then many insects have chemical defenses. I already talked about the urticating hairs, right? That's part of what they can have. They can have stinging venom with that. Uh, stink bugs, they kick out and maybe you grab the stink bug and then you get that odor stuff on your hand that kind of stinks and all that kind of stuff. But that helps protect them from predators, right? Uh, we know that, uh, you know, the, the, the monarch butterfly has a very bitter taste because it feeds upon uh, the milkweed, right? But And then birds, once they've ate a couple of those, they realize I'm not going to eat them anymore. But then you have the viceroys that look like the monarch that are protected because they mimic the monarch, right? So lots of different stuff going on. Here's another form of mimicry where this, this caterpillar looks like a, a stick, right? It looks like a plant, like it's not something that is a food source. And also, you know, every living thing in this world, once it's found, is, is described and given a name, right? And, and you can see by the nomen, nomenclature here, we start with the kingdoms, go down to phylum class, and all the way down to genus and species. And this here is a granary weevil that we're looking at. And, and, we, and we as scientists have to group our things so that way when we're, you know, speaking different languages and whatever around the world, when we use this scientific nomenclature, we know we're speaking about a specific living organism, right? And insects belong to this phylum Arthropoda. We already talked about that, but it's a very broad phylum that includes, you know, uh, you know, scorpions and spiders and shrimp and lobsters, all kinds of different stuff. But class insecta is much more specific. And we've already talked about those characteristics of the insecta. Now, we have about 30 orders or so within the insecta. And I'm saying or so because there's some argument about whether some, in, well, some of these orders are actually insects or not. So let's, let's talk about a few of those orders and we'll be toward the end here. Um, now, these orders can be broken up again based upon, remember, their metamorphosis that we talked about. We have certain orders that really don't go through metamorphosis. So we call it a metabolist, right? And that's a term you may hear. And they, they do molt and they get bigger, but they don't really they don't really have to shed everything. It, it's just different. They just get bigger, right? There's really not a form of metamorphosis. Then we have those are what we call incomplete or gradual metamorphosis. And you probably can think of what we're talking about there. We'll go from there. And then we have those that I'll talk about that are complete metamorphosis. And those are the ones that have a, a pupil stage and such too. So we'll talk about that. So what about the A metabolist orders? And you can already see you know, a silverfish here, right? So here you have eggs and then you have these nymphal stages and you have that adult. But in this case, even the, some of these adults will even continue to kind of grow, right? Continue to molt. But it's not a true metamorphosis. And that's why some scientists don't consider silverfish and fire brats and, and they, don't, they don't actually consider them insects. So we'll, we'll, we'll consider them as insects still, what we're talking about, but just know there is some argument out there. All right. Yeah, springtails is another one they argue about. Now they're really insects or not, right? Now let's talk about incomplete metamorphosis and then we'll go to complete. And you can see some of these orders we're going to talk about. I mean, there's a lot of, I said there's 30, there's more orders, right? But let's focus on some of these ones we deal with quite a bit. So let's focus first upon the incomplete and we'll start with the, you know, hemiptera and stuff. So what, what happens with a, a, a hemimetabolous orders is you have incomplete or another term is gradual metamorphosis. So here, again, you start with an egg, living, breathing animal in that egg, it hatches, and now you have these nymphal stages. And they go through a series of molts, and this is true metamorphosis, 
And then finally, you get to that end adult. And this adult is now reproductively viable, and it's done re uh, molting, okay? Uh, and, and if they are a winged form, of course, those wings will develop as external pads. You can see them getting bigger here at the various nymphal stages until the final functional weight. So we got the hemiptera, the orthoptera, the lutodia, and we'll talk about some of those characteristics in order here. So here's the hemiptera. Now, this is where, you know, it's always funky to say this, right? These are the true bugs. Does that mean the other ones are false bugs? No, right? But when we talk about true bugs, what we're talking about is the hemiptera. And these are the cicadas and the leaf hoppers and the plant hoppers and the aphids and the white flies and various scale insects. So there's quite a few different ones out there. And the reason we call them hemiptera is hemi means half. Again, here's that leathery uh, forewing that is very protective and then a membranous full length hind wing that's partially covered by this hemi wing in the front, right? So hemi means half and terra means wing. And that's what that name uh, refers to. Uh, they have person sucking mouth parts, usually rising from the front of the head, which is different than another group called the homoptera, which would be from the bottom of the head. Usually have long antennae, and we do have a lot of terrestrial species, but also some aquatic species here in this order, too. And you can see, I mean, we're talking, you know, 80,000 species or so out there. Some are predaceous and some are, many are plant feeders, okay? Here's some great examples. Stink bugs, squash bugs, ligus bugs, chinch bugs, right? Assassin bugs. You can see some of these are predation, some are feeding upon plants, right? Here's, the, here's our friend, the bed bug, they belong to this group too. Uh, and, and water striders, which, you know, do uh, forage and feed upon the top of the water as part of their life cycle. And then we have the plant hoppers and the leaf hoppers and the cicadas. Now, this is a little different because we call them homoptera. And throughout, I mean, homo means throughout, and that means this entire wing is now membranous. Right? It's not that hemi wing we were talking about. And all of these are plant feeders, right? And they all have piercing, sucking mouth parts. And many of these are pretty important because they can transmit diseases within the plant uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, brown plant hopper, corn, you know, just different ones. So the cicadas, and some of them have fantastic biologies if you'd like to read about them. We have these generational broods that come off, and some years there are lots of cicadas around. Other years, not as many, but there's always some that are coming out every year. Beautiful insects, too. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, 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 the piercing, sucking mouth parts of the aphids, the white flies. And, and again, extremely problematic pests can be because they can transmit lots of diseases. And, of course, they can produce honeydew, which then provides food for other critters like ants and such, but then can turn moldy, right? The black study mold, and that can be an issue for our customers, too. There's some great examples here. The aphids, you know, the great phylloxera, peach aphids, a big one. Uh, white flies are hugely problematic, especially in greenhouse uh, production, that kind of thing. Lots of different types of scale insects out there and mealybugs too. All right, let's jump over to the orthoptera. Now, this is the grasshoppers again. Uh, and ortho means straight and terra means wing. That's because if you look at the top of this insect, it has that straight line to it, right? And that's where this term comes from. It has that leathery protective forewing that covers that membranous hind wing, uh, chewing mouth parts again, the, almost always a, a plant material type of, uh, of pest. And uh, this is, you know, insects, as we know, uh, these, these grasshoppers and crickets, they can use their, their wings and legs and kind of rub them together, use stridulation for the males to call the females uh, when it's time for, for mating. And quite a few different species, you know, more than 20,000 species out there. And this isn't just the grasshoppers, it's the crickets and the locusts and the katydids too. So very, you know, very, very di uh, diverse order. Uh, the mantids are pretty fascinating, right? Not as many species, but still over, you know, 2,400 species around the world. Uh, predaceous, right? So they're bi biocontrol type of thing. They're, they're actually excellent to have around. Um, and th their four legs, as we talked about, have been modified for grasping. So they, they do have an uthecal egg case, similar to what we see with cockroaches, right? Where they May, uh, they can protect their eggs, which helps with survivability of the young, right? So that's a good evolutionary characteristics. So let's talk about cockroaches, right? So this is your order Blatodia, and this has kind of changed, if you will, over the last 10 to 12 years, because now we've determined that cockroaches and termites are, should be, you know, termites are types of cockroaches, right? So now we could say there's over 7,700 species worldwide because we had the cockroaches and termites together. 
not all termites have a new fecal egg case, but some, uh, you know a few do. But certainly, uh, all the almost all the cockroaches use new fecal egg case to protect their eggs. And you know these are public health pests, or can be. You know the American cockroach, German cockroach, or animals, and they're omnivores. They eat lots of different things, which we know, which was, makes it difficult to control sometimes too. Very fast runners, very good at at actually sensing their environment with their cirrhosis as well as their antennae. And then we, we actually took the Isoptera, which used to be a, 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 its own order, and made it a suborder, if you will, under the cockroaches, Blatodia, right? And of course, we know Iso means equal and Terra means wing. That's why the swarmers have the same shape and same size wings. And uh, these are actually social insects, too, a little bit different. And we can target, you know, these, these termites by the use of an IGR called a kite and synthesis inhibitor. And I just talked about molting. So you can see what happens when we get rid of that chitin and it's not there available for the proper synthesis of the exoskeleton, then that allows that insect to, to perish. And then when you get enough of the, that happening in a colony of termites, it can be eliminated. And that's, that's the whole basis of our termite baiting systems like the Cholona here or the Centricon that's out there. Uh, you know, get them in there and mess up their, their molting processes. All right, let's see. We still got a few more minutes. So we talked about the whole metabolism orders, right? This is different now because now we start with an egg and then they hatch, but now we have instars that we call larval forms. And there could be one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is, depending on the species. And then they have a huge change. They go to this pupil stage, which you know, within this puparium or this chrysalis or whatever it might be, or this pupae, then that is going through some massive changes to have the final free living adult, okay? So th there's no nymph here, right? This is all going to be larvae, pupae, and adult. So the first, and, and many of these are what we call super orders, meaning there's lots and lots of species, right? And, and, and with flies, you know, we believe we've only found a, a fraction of the flies that are actually out there. There's a lot of very small minute flies in the tropics just haven't been collected and identified, right? But still, die means two and terra means winged. So we see one pair or two pair, you know, one pair or two membranous wings. Now, the second pair is there, but it's been, uh, I'll, I'll show you a video of this, but they've been changed to what's called halteers, which help them in flight. Because even though they only have, you know, one pair of membranous wings. They're fantastic flyers, right? Uh, immatures for flies, we call them maggots. They have chewing mouth parts, but these adults have either sponging or piercing sucking mouth parts, depending on the species. So a whole different change in the in the morphology of these animals. And many of these are public health pests too, but also a lot of them are critical because they help with uh, recycling dead matter back in the soil, dead animals, whatever it is, okay? So here's a surfeit fly, and, and, and one thing about a surfeit fly, right, is it's got that mimicry that makes it look like it's a stinging type of insect, and it's not, right? But I'm going to start this video, and this is in slow motion. You can see the membranous wings going up and down, right? It's going to fly, but look right below that wing, and you can see that little dot going up and down. That's the end of the halteer. So what the halteer is, it's like a, a gyroscope, right? Oh, I love that video right there. See how you can really see that halteer going up and down? It is a counterbalance to the wing that allows the surfeit fly to uh, fly in three-dimensional space with extreme alacrity, right? So that this is a, a fantastic evolutionary change that allows an insect with only one pair of functional wings for flying to fly in, in an extremely well manner, right? I love surfing flies because so they got these massive halteers. But you can take a house fly and move that membrane and swing aside, and you can see that that little gyroscope, that halteer inside that pit. And it's inside a pit because every time it moves and touches the pit, that's the sensory that allows it to know where it's at, kind of in three dimensional space, which is just fascinating to think about, right? Lots of different flies out there: horse flies, blow flies, bots, leaf miners. Of course, mosquitoes are dipterns. Uh, screw worms from the Mediterranean, uh, different wasps or different tachinid flies, if you will, uh, that are predaceous and they help too. Another super order of the beetles, right? The coleoptera. And some of them are extremely beautiful, right? Uh, coleo means sheath and then terra means wing. That's because we talked about that, that hard covering that protected the wings, right? Um, they have chewing mouth parts. And a lot of variation around their types of uh, structures of the mouth parts as well as the antennae. 
Uh, some of them are, you know, most of them are just in the ecosystems doing, a, you know, what they're supposed to do. Some of them are very beneficial, like the, the dung beetles and the dung rollers and that type of thing. But some of them are damaging, right? They can damage crops, either the larval forms or the adults. Some spread diseases. Uh, think of Dutch elm disease in the United States. Um, certainly there's you know, quite a few of them can be pests too. Lots of examples. Uh, uh, ladybird beetles, of course, are extremely important for biocontrol. Uh, weevils, we, we deal with quite a few weevils and stored product pests. Uh, bill bugs, fireflies, wireworms, you know, all kinds of different uh, beetles out there. So the, the third of the, of the four superorders is the Lepidoptera. These are the moths and the butterflies, right? Uh, and the larval forms we call caterpillars. And there can be, you know, two, three, four, five different instars. And each one gets bigger. And of course, they're feeding almost exclusively upon plant materials. So they're going to be in a whole different habitat. But then the pupae, and depending on this, you know, the, whether it's moths or butterflies or whatever, we can call them chrysalis, we'll call them cocoons, cocoons, man, I can't speak this morning very well. Uh, but anyway, then the adult comes out, and it's, it's, for the most part, will be a free-flying, free-wheeling uh, adult, which can go to a whole different habitat. And of course, they're not going to feed upon plants, they're going to feed upon nectar and pollen, right? So a little bit different. Quite a few species described, and there's more that are out there still. Um, moths usually nighttime type of uh, flying, attracted to lights quite readily, and many of them will have this A shape to them, right? You'll see that too. Um, and they have these, you know, the antenna could be, uh, that's where you all these feathered antennae we were showing, or even the filamentous ones too. Butterflies usually more colorful. A lot of that has to do with mimicry or protection or whatever it might be. Uh, wings are usually held straight up like this. And sometimes they'll have at the end of their antennae kind of thread-like with a knob at the end, right? We'll see that too. Uh, cabbage loopers, army worms, corn ear worms, Indian meal moths. We deal with a lot of um, closed moths, Indian meal moths, and what we do, coddling moths, uh, monarchs, swallowtails, lots, lots of them out there as well aware of. So the last super order I'll talk about is the hymenoptera, right? These are the bees and the ants and the wasps. Uh, hymen refer, refers to this membranous type of wing here, but it's actually the, the connection between them. So they, when they fly, they fly in, in unison and tandem. Uh, and they have chewing mouth parts, although bees modify it to chewing lapping, right? Um, the wing members, have they have two pairs of membranous wings, four wings total. And, uh, and many of these insects, not all, but many of them have what we call eusocial behaviors, which are the highest level of social behavior. So certainly ants are all social, honeybees are social, wasps, you know, yellow jackets are social, but we also have solitary wasps, like cicada killers. And solitary bees like mason bees right that are not solitary or excuse me not social quite a few species out there um saw flies lots of different ants many of them are pests not all of them but many of them are pests that we deal with uh bees um but most of them are, of course quite beneficial although carpenter bees can be damaging to some of our customer structures and they can be a medical pest at times some of these bees too and certainly wasps can be quite aggressive so just to reiterate, you know, they're extremely important in the ecosystem. Crop pollination is fantastic and we need it because we've got to feed the world. And that's going to be our major challenge over the next, you know, 50 years um, or so. And, and in fact, I've seen estimates that say, I want you to think about this for a second. We have to produce more food between now and 2050 to feed the world than mankind has produced since the beginning of time. That is just huge, right? And we don't have more land, we have less land, right? So we have to do it through, through technology and innovation. And, um, you know, somebody sits there and laughs and says, GMO stuff isn't good. GMO is the way we're going to feed the world because we have to be able to put out the, the nutritious food as well as the amount of food to feed people. Uh, and of course, back in the ecosystem and all that kind of stuff too for the, the decomposition. But yet, hey, this is where we kick in because we're helping with the threat side whether it's nuisance, whether it's damage, whether it's disease transmission, whatever it might be. Um, we as pest management professionals, you know, I'm really proud to be part of this because I've already talked about the food situation. We're a huge part of protecting the food that is produced and is provided because we're helping get it all the way to the table so people can feed upon it, right? But yet we're also protecting against allergic reactions and stinging and public health pests and disease transmission and certainly protecting structures and damage. So that's all critical. So a couple of questions and then I'm done, right? So 
there are more insects than all plants and all other animals combined. Is that true? And, and that is a true statement. And it is true they impact all, uh, you know, terrestrial, but also freshwater ecosystems. We don't see many insects in the ocean, right? Now that's where the, you know, there's different types of arthropods that do well in the ocean, but for the most part, insects don't. So that's one habitat they have not been able to take over very well. Um, which of the following is not the characteristic of insects? Antenna? Well, of course not. They have antenna. They got three body regions. What they don't have is petty palps, right? That'd be like for spiders and scorpions and things like that. So when we talk about how the process that they grow, you know, from egg to larval, to, in, this, in this example, right? Pupae adult, well, hey, we're talking about metamorphosis, right? And which of the following insecticide classes it targets the nervous system of the insect. Did pyrethroids? Well, sure they do, right? Right in that sheath we were talking about. How about carbamates? Well, yeah, they do too. Phenopyroles, hmm, that's a tough one. Well, yes, they do. That's the terminal order. It works up here, the phenopyrazoles. And then juvenile hormone analogs and borates? Nope, they work on that stomach lining, right? Or, or within the blood system too. So those areas. What insects... What insects does the order name Diptera refer to? Beetles, dragonflies, ants, true flies, and, and here, true flies, meaning there's false flies out there, right? Well, the reason they might say true flies is because we're not talking about dragonflies, damselflies, where they have fly in the name, but it's not a diptera, right? That's a different order. Um, and what does the order name mean? What does Diptera mean? Well, it means one pair of wings or you know, two wings, but one pair. And what's special about that second pair of wings we can't see? Well, it's that gyroscope, right? It's that hall tears that we were, we were talking about. And which of the following insecticide classes impacts the insect exoskeleton during the molting process? And impacting the, well, it's those chitin synthesis inhibitors like we have in our termite baits. In fact, uh, Dimelin was a product used on gypsy moth control in the Appalachians for many years because they would use the it was a chitin synthesis inhibitor. It wouldn't allow the gypsy moth to mold properly. Okay, well, I'm at the end of this. I'll go back to my front with the email and my uh, phone number and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, I'll open it up. I mean, I, it's always been open, but kick on in.